I've been doing this for almost 45 years now, and uh, it was funny, a couple of the folks in, that I was talking to uh, out in the hallway reminded me that, that we've got some rugby players in your, uh, in your group, and uh, the reason I'm having a cane uh, is because uh, in January I had knee replacement surgery that once went back to the days uh, when I was about 30 during what I call my between lives stage, when a buddy of mine got me involved in playing rugby for the Calvert, uh, what was then a Calvert rugby team. So that was about a year and a half of crazy time, and uh, I'm paying the price for it now, but hopefully this will go away shortly. So, as I said, this is going to be a little bit of a refresher. Your role as an advocate, uh, some tips, how we deal with witnesses, how we deal with clients. You know, sometimes we wonder why we do it, but I really do think that uh, this, is, uh, this is fun. But we all know that there are times <coughs> when we're walking into the, uh, into the courtroom and jurors look at us and they form an initial impression. And particularly when we're on the defense side, sometimes this is how we are viewed initially. So, I don't think that's fair. <laughs> I was a prosecutor for 15 years, and I remember when I was the deputy state's attorney first came in, we had a, we had a staff meeting, and I said, look, guys and girls, we all, we wear the white hat in this courtroom. We're doing God's work. Well, then I went on to the private side, and I wrote an article for the Bar Newsletter, and I said, you know, that white hat, it fits just as well on the defense head as it does the state's head. So I think we've got to tell folks and, and remind folks that both sides fight for justice. Both sides can wear the white hat in the courtroom. But let us never forget that as friendly as we may be in the hallway, when we walk through those doors, it's a battle. It's a fight. No quarter given. I may ask you about your grandson in the hallway, but when we walk through that door, it ain't going to be what it's about. <laughs> However, even in the courtroom, one of the things that is most important is to remember that while we're doing battle, you can do battle where the rules of engagement do not cause you to disregard civility. You can be aggressive, you can be hard fighting, but there's a line beyond which you don't need to go. Today's trial is going to be over. And you've got to be back tomorrow. And you've got to deal with folks again tomorrow. And you want your reputation to be not made by something stupid you did in a single case that will last forever. You want your reputation to be made by how you deal with your colleagues and members of the bench every day, all the time. But, as we know, Colonel Jackson, did you order the code gray? You don't have to answer the question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Well, we all know uh, that there are times in the courtroom when we, we get our juices flowing, and uh, that's part of what really makes it fun. You know, when you're in there and you're in that battle, and you're thinking, and you're realizing, you're, you're reacting, that a lot of times when you're not even thinking about what you're doing, because you've been tuned and trained to hear things in the courtroom, and, you know, I've had it happen. I go back and say, what, what made me object to that? I mean, I was right, maybe. But I didn't really think about it. It happens instinctively. And that's the product of, of good trial lawyers trying many cases. <laughs> so one of the other great things about this profession is you come across stories and you come across things that you simply could never anticipate. Great stories, great uh, events. <laughs> Where could you ever anticipate getting anything like that? 
And for all the police officers who we respect and do their job uh, in a hard-fought way, sometimes they have to live with being reminded of things like this. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that we always um, get asked by people who are not in our profession or often get asked is, how can you represent somebody that you know is guilty? And, you know, first of all, you don't know the answer. You don't always know if they're guilty. You don't know if they are, if they've done something wrong, the level of their wrongdoing. And it's always a refreshing to have somebody sitting in your office, and I think in particular of the number of police officers I've represented over the years who will sit in my office uh, vehement about not having done something wrong, outraged that somebody could make a decision that's going to affect their future. Sometimes they're waiting for that decision to be made, sometimes it's already been made. And, and I have to, at least not initially, resist saying, you realize every time you were on the street and you locked up that young kid in a car of four for a joint without being able to know for sure which of the four people that were locked up had it, if any, and what effect that had on their lives, what effect that could have had, you made that decision. Somebody else is now in the driver's seat making that decision for you. and it, it is um, an interesting experience to see how folks, whether they're police officers or those family members who, but for being in your office asking you to represent their son or daughter uh, or significant other, would have been railing after seeing how a judicial officer might have treated somebody for a similar offense in offering some sort of lenient treatment or allowing them out on bail. So. Uh, we have a, a job of, of educating. It's not going to happen. It gets the education occurs when they come into your office and they real and they realize what value we have. But sometimes, you know, we have those clients who you really got to suck it up, and it's almost like you know being a doctor. You compartmentalize what's in your in your brain. A person who has just shot a police officer comes into the emergency room to be treated for a gunshot wound. Uh, does the doctor think about what that person just did or do they compartmentalize it and sort of say to themselves, this is my job, this is what I have to do, I'll think about the other things later. You know, child abuse cases that we handle are very tough when you have to try to cross-examine a child or sex offense victims or people who have lost others and uh, loved ones in crimes of violence. But, you know, that's what we're trained to do and we've got to compartmentalize it and we've got to get it done as tough as it, uh, as, it, as it can be at times. The judge is guilty well, wait, wait, of beating wait, and wait, raging wait, all night. Arthur, you're talking yeah. crazy now. You don't know he's guilty. You're making an assumption he's guilty because you hate him so much, right? He's been a few years. What difference does it make? Come on. A defense lawyer has to defend people who are guilty. You know that. Would you defend him? I would, Arthur, because it's my job, you know? Look, you took an oath to defend your clients to the best of your ability. Now, if you can't do that, then get out. Now, I don't want to say we don't care, but there's you got a job to do, you do your job. But you don't want to be, and I don't know if you can read this or not, but I got this uh, sent to me, um, uh, an order issued by a judge who was clearly frustrated uh, with lawyers in the case. <laughs> you can't read that in the back. Okay. It says, the court has received the party's whiny letters. <laughs> what is wrong with you, parties slash lawyers? Just in caps, 
stop it. There will be no extension granted on the med motions deadline. Don't ask. This is my oldest and least favorite case. Please stop trying to become my least favorite lawyers. Happy holidays. <laughs> so this is what I think we, we all have different styles. And you know, I, Megan, Megan is the methodical. She will have everything lined up uh, and she will go through a list and, and tear somebody apart in this methodical sort of way that goes right down the list. I wait. Now, I like to think I'm, it's a prepared waiting, but sometimes I don't know what I'm going to say, you know, in the next 60 seconds. And we all have our own style, and it doesn't mean one is better than the other. It just is what works for you. You can't be somebody else. Control in the courtroom also means being in the courtroom on time. Now, we all know that there are jurisdictions where judges are on the bench on time, and there are jurisdictions when they're not. But whether the judge is there or not, you know, sometimes we get a little sloppy. And I'm guilty of this sometimes in certain jurisdictions as well, when I know if I'm there at 9 o'clock, I'm going to be waiting until 9.30. But when you're in a jury situation in particular, you want to be in the courtroom. You don't want something to be happening uh, where somebody's waiting for you. And, and plus, just over time, it's, it's good practice. I know in Prince George's County, if I'm in front of Judge McKee, the retired judge who was in the Marines, if he's courtroom starting at 9 o'clock, he's on the bench at 8.55. So to him, being on time means being early. And you, you don't want to be that lawyer that the judge has said, oh, there's Bob again. He's not here. Where is he? What have you heard from? We have trials. Everything is different. you got to be prepared in all of your cases to have control in the courtroom. So get yourself ready. If you're prepared, you're going to feel confident. You'll have that power of confidence that we all need to have. So go in for a good fight. So organization, preparation, in my judgment, and I'm sure in yours, equals confidence. Have your game plan. Points of attack. I heard a lawyer many, many years ago uh, in a... CLE I went to, uh, say something that, that has stuck with me uh, ever since on cross-examination. We all know you don't repeat everything the, the prosecution says. And this goes for you know either side. Figure out what makes sense. What are you going to do? What do you, points do you need to make? What's the game plan? Just don't go winging it. So you may have a number of issues in your case, but some of them you may not be able to, to spend time on and make any progress other than to dig a deeper hole. Figure out what it is you can make progress on. Get in, get out. Don't commit yourself to something unless you're sure you not only can make it work, but that you have a backup plan. So if you have all of that stuff together, then when you're in the courtroom, you're going to be confident. What's your excuse? Sir, excuse for what, sir? I'm asking the fucking questions here, Parker. Do you understand? Sir, yes, sir. to be confident. You want to be in control. You're not going to be confident. You're not going to be in control if you're not prepared, if you're not organized, if you don't make a good presentation. And when you're in the courtroom, just like with the client, listen. You don't have to say something every time you have an opportunity. Look. Listen. Stop. If you're not paying attention, if you're futzing around with your cell phone in those courts where you can get away with that, if you're futzing around with your notes, things can happen very quickly that you may miss. First, tell Tommy what to do. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> now, if you hadn't been looking carefully, you would have missed. The good present given. <laughs> so,
other thing that I, I love is how, and I talked about this a little bit with police clients, how defense lawyers can go from being Darth Vader to being Once they got a call. And we come to the rescue. Now, the other thing, you gotta be prepared for surprises. Has anybody ever had a trial that goes precisely as you expected it to go? You've got to be flexible. You've got to be prepared to change your plan. And you can't change your plan if you're not feeling the courtroom. You've got to feel the courtroom. And if your head's in your notes, you're not feeling the courtroom. You've got to feel the witness. You've got to be prepared to adjust to what's going on. So the other thing, just suggestions. How do you get a witness prepared to testify? One of my approaches with witnesses is to say, look, remember this one thing. When you're testifying, you know what happened. You were there, I wasn't there, Prosecutor wasn't there, judge wasn't there, jury wasn't there. What is the best way to defend yourself when you're testifying? It isn't to anticipate what the next question is going to be. It's not try to protect yourself from future questions by how you answer this one. It is to put blinders on and to say to yourself, this is the question. I'm going to be like a fly on the wall. I'm going to be like a reporter of events. I'm going to detach myself to some degree from the situation and simply say what is my best and most accurate memory of what occurred. And when I do that, whether I'm asked that question one time, six times, whether I'm asked it at the beginning or the end of a lengthy cross-examination, my answer is always going to be the same. On the other hand, if I'm anticipating how I'm going to protect myself from the next question, my answer isn't going to, it's, it's not going to be the same. And it may not be the same later. So. I suggest that as, as something uh, perhaps to consider. <coughs> and then classic advice. Know when to shut up. Know when to sit down. Now, I gotta tell you, sometimes it feels like you're about ready to call your malpractice carrier when the client hears you say no questions after witness, after witness, after witness. Mm -hmm. When you have detected a, de a deficient deficiency in the government's proof, and you're just hoping that they don't fix it by the end of the case, <laughs> they need to know when to sit down and shut up. I learned this lesson in front of Judge Howard Chasnow when I was a baby prosecutor. And we had a motions hearing, and I thought he screwed up. And I had a pencil or a pen in my hand, and I went like that at the trial table. And boy, did I get reamed out. And I have never forgotten that lesson. And as tough as it is when you're losing, you got to suck it up. you got to just wait till you get outside of the courtroom and out of earshot or go home and kick the wall or kick the dog. Don't beat the wife, not in these days. Uh, you, you just get yourself in trouble. Um, do not do it in the courtroom. You'll live to fight another day. And if the judge is wrong, there'll be a time, in most cases, for that to There is nothing that is more central to going into trial, I think, than a magic marker. Because with all of this technology, when it doesn't work, a poster board and a magic marker oftentimes can save the day. When I started, we didn't have all this craziness. Uh, I think back in the day when Judge Densford started, they probably didn't even have a number two pencils. But, but it, <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Again, <laughs> so again, I'm Megan, I'm Megan Coleman.
And as Bob said to you, he and I definitely have different styles in the courtroom. And I'll tell you, part of that is because he has white hair and is known by everybody in the state of Maryland and his reputation you know, enters before he enters the courtroom. So for the um, less senior lawyers in the room and the ones that are traveling you know, from county to county where maybe you don't, you're not as familiar with um, the parties or the judges, I think you do have to kind of develop a different style, especially in the beginning. And perhaps that's why I'm more tuned into the rules and the case law, because I find that I'm put on the spot more by judges than Mr. Bonds is. And a great example, um, you had done a murder trial very early on when I was an associate in Montgomery County, and Bob was introducing or trying to um, admit some jury instructions on um, murder and self-defense and imperfect self-defense, and they were not your standard instructions. And I became friends with the law clerk in that case, and years after the trial, the, so the judge ended up giving the instructions that Bob had proposed, and years later when I went to dinner with the law clerk, she said that um, she went back to the judge and the judge said, well, what's Bonson's authority for this? And the law clerk said, well, he didn't cite any authority. And the judge goes, well, if Bonson says it's good enough, then it's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so that would not fly, though, if I had tried to propose some modified instructions. So it is important, especially when you're first starting off or if you look younger or you're just not known in the jurisdiction, that you do have the case law with you and the rules. And also, if you are in a place where you feel uncomfortable, remember, no offense to any judge who's here, but the judge doesn't always get it right. And I've actually had two recent occasions, um, one in this trial that we just had, where a uh, witness was on the stand who started to testify as to statements that the defendant made. And the discovery rule is clear that all statements by the defendant, whether they're written statements, statements to the police, or oral statements, have to be turned over to the defense attorney before trial. And these statements that this witness began to give had not been turned over to us in discovery. I objected. The court very um, quickly uh, overruled my objection and said, Ms. Coleman, the rules don't require that. I knew I was right, but I didn't tell her that I knew that. But my, my objection was preserved for the record. Um, and likewise, in another county that I was in, I had asked the judge to give, it was a <coughs> prostitution and human trafficking case, and I had asked the judge to give the strong feelings question to the voir dire, asking if they had strong feelings about the offenses of human trafficking and uh, prostitution, and that's based on the Pearson case, which has been law since 2014. And um, so the judge, she asked, she, first she didn't want to ask the um, question, and I brought up my case law, I, I actually had it printed. So then she asked the question, and a number of potential jurors raised their hand that they had strong feelings, but then the judge did not uh, allow me to ask the follow-up question at the bench, okay, well, what are those strong feelings? The judge just simply said, you got your strong feelings question, um, and that was it. So I'm used to getting those responses in the beginning. It certainly would fluster me. I would call Bob. Um, on break, you know, sometimes actually in tears, you know, the judge, da, 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 da. but now I just um, feel more comfortable. You know, you make your objection, you say what you think the law is, and if the judge gets it wrong, you know, there's nothing more you can do. You're not going to get into an argument, you're not going to win in the court, so just preserve your record. And that's going to be one of the first um, things that we talk about here is preserving the record. Now, I don't know how many of you practice in the appellate courts, but even if you don't, you need to, when you're representing the interest of the state, if you're a prosecutor, or when you're representing the interest of a defendant as a defense attorney, you, you should be thinking about appeals in the back of your mind and making sure that you are preserving the record if the case doesn't go um, exactly as planned. So with voir dire and jury instructions, it's always good practice to submit your own proposals in writing. Sometimes lawyers get lazy and they just rely on the judge's law clerk to give the standard instructions. But usually there are questions that can be tailored in voir dire to the facts of your case. The thing you gotta remember is a lot of times these voir dire and jury instruction conferences are done in chambers, which is great because it's a more casual setting. 
but then the objections that you're making to the court and chambers, they're not being recorded. So you have to remember when you come back out in open court to state on the record what you're agreeing with and what you're disagreeing with with respect to what just occurred in chambers. Um, also, when you when the jury is finally selected and the judge will always ask the state and the defense attorney, okay, is this jury um, acceptable? If you, as the state or defense attorney, uh, lost in terms of um, you didn't have a question asked or propounded upon the voir dire panel, um, you don't want to say that the jury is acceptable because then you have waived now the prior question that you asked to be propounded that was not. So what you can do is you can approach the bench and say, Your Honor, we're going to say in front of the jury that they're acceptable because we don't want them to think that you know we're offended by them but we're not waiving our previous request for this question or this instruction to have been given. So just make sure you're gonna see this again. You also don't wanna say okay to the judge uh, when rulings are made that are not in your favor. Oftentimes it's just the colloquial nature, right? That we just say, okay, your honor, but we're not, the way that reads on a transcript when you're writing an appeal is, you know, Bonds and Racon and saying okay to the judge. It, the inflection is not there. So you have to be really careful about how you respond for purposes of the transcripts. If you are submitting jury instructions that are not pattern, you want to make sure that you number each paragraph. For example, if you're submitting a special instruction on self-defense and you have a couple of additional theories that you want to be read to the jury, break it down point by point because what we've found is judges don't like to stray from the pattern instructions. But if they do stray, they don't often like to give you uh, you know, four different paragraphs. They, they, they like to balance it out with what the state has given. So a judge might be willing to give you one, paragraph one and paragraph three, and it's much easier if you have it broken out for them. And likewise, on appeal, it's gonna be easier for the appellate court to see precisely <coughs> what you requested and what the judge um, struck out. And you also wanna remember to admit, or um, yes, introduce into evidence, at least as identification, the proposals that you had wanted so that that goes up to the Court of Special Appeals on appeal. Other ways to preserve your record, lawyers often ask for continuing objections and that's an adequate thing to do, but you need to make sure that the scope of the continuing objection is defined um, for, for the court and for the record. You cannot just assume that you have a continuing objection every time a certain topic or pieces of evidence are introduced. You really need to set forth what the parameters are because what we've seen on appeal is it's more likely that the appellate court is going to say that the argument you're not, that you're now making on appeal was not part of that continuing objection that was granted. So you really need to be specific about what the continuing objection will pertain to and make sure that the court has granted the request. As I said before, just anything that you try to offer that gets excluded, just mark it as an exhibit for identification so that it goes up on appeal. Again, don't acquiesce, don't just say okay. For MJOAs, the case law has told us that you really do need to be specific to each and every element for each and every count. So if you don't bring up, um, you know, um, in a, say in a uh, first degree assault case, you know, maybe you, had an issue of intent for first degree assault, and then you also had um, issues relating to whether it was, um, you know, conduct that, whether you intended it to result in uh, grievous or serious bodily injury. If you are not specifying which element of first degree offense, it's gonna be waived on appeal if you're trying to argue that the evidence was insufficient. So you need to be really specific about each of the elements in the offenses that the defendant is charged with. For a renewed MJOA at the end of the defense case or if there's a rebuttal case by the state, be sure to adopt and incorporate your previous arguments so that they're not waived. All right, opening statements and closing arguments. So we've given you guys handouts that um, are the from our Prince George's County Bar Association newsletter that we author. And the one on openings so, and closings, I think is this is a, a pretty one. thorough yeah, one. Yeah. There are a ton of cases Very listed by topic to in terms of, you know, where there's been reversal. <laughs> As Bob said, sometimes when you get 
in trial, the juices are flowing, especially by the time you're at closing arguments, and you or your opponent may start to say things that they don't even realize is objectionable. So, um, okay, Bob told me he added a few things that I really <laughs> wasn't anticipating. So Just a couple of uh, <laughs> examples of things. We're opening, one for opening and one for closing. Ladies and gentlemen, Chelsea Bearden did not kill Ricky Brown. The prosecution has suggested a possible motive, but one based entirely on hearsay, conjecture, and circumstantial evidence. Evidence that on the surface would appear to have some substance, but upon closer examination, will prove to have no relevance whatsoever to this case. You're not buying the sergeant. You're not listening to a word I'm saying. Really? Right? Well, guess what? I don't believe you. After listening to Mr. Blanchard lay out the prosecution's evidence, even I'm convinced my client murdered Victor Tapp. After all, I walked in the room and found Victor Tapp dead on the floor, and Chelsea Bearden's fingerprints all over the weapon that killed him. There isn't much in the world that would convince me that she wasn't guilty. Look, let's just save ourselves a lot of time here. Let's be honest. I'm sure there are a lot better things for us to be doing. Who thinks Chelsea Bearden is guilty? <laughs> Objection, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> especially difficult problem because we've developed a legal concept in this country to protect ourselves, to protect our rights. And it's called a presumption of innocence. It's not a simpler word, but it means that one is presumed innocent until proven guilty. And that means that whatever assumptions you might have already made in this case, that Chelsea Beard must be seen in your eyes, must be believed in your minds, must be understood in your hearts. Gentlemen of the jury, my name is Arthur Kriplin, and I am the defense counsel for the defendant, Judge Henry T. Clement. Justice for all. regardless of who's guilty or innocent. Winning is everything. <laughs> the prosecution's case, he's got to have one. Not a witness, not one piece of substantiating evidence other than the testimony of the victim herself. The one that bothers 
the one thing that stayed in my mind and I couldn't get rid of it, that haunted me, was why. Why would she lie? What was her motive for lying? If my client is innocent, she's lying. Why? Was it blackmail? Jealousy? No. Yesterday, I found out why. She doesn't have a motive. You know why? Because she's not. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No. Because I'm going to get him. My client, the Honorable Henry T. Fleming, should go right to fucking jail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so there were obviously a lot of um, objectionable. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll, we're going to walk through some of them. But again, the handout that you have um, has each of the cases with their citation and various examples. Mm -hmm. So the first is, you know, as, as Bob said earlier, an opening statement. Do not state facts which are plainly inadmissible or that you do not expect to prove. And um, what occurred in this case, Johnson versus State, a 2016 case, this was actually out of Prince George's County, where it was the defense counsel who, in opening statement, made no less than 26 factual assertions, but then never proved them up on cross-examination of the state's witnesses and never uh, put on the defense case and therefore did not prove any of the um, facts that he had alleged in opening. So at the end of the defense case, well, when the defense just simply <coughs> asked it, the state asked for a mistrial and was granted it, and that was upheld on appeal. And the state was allowed to uh, have a retrial because the defense attorney made so many assertions that were not proven. So you gotta be very careful in your opening statement. Um, likewise, prosecutors, you need to remember in opening statements especially, not to use the phrase testifying when talking about a statement that the defendant made. So you know that you might have from discovery statements that the defendant made to a police officer or made to a witness or made in some other format, but that's not the equivalent of a defendant testifying. So don't an opening statement say, and the defendant will testify to this, this, and this. What you really mean is, is you will hear that the defendant said on this occasion this, this, and this. And so when you look at these, the Simpson case and the Walls case, the difference between the two was in the Simpson case, the prosecutor repeatedly said that the defendant will tell you. In fact, the prosecutor didn't even use the word um, testify, but just kept saying will tell you. And on appeal, the court said that it was the inference to the jury was that the defendant was going to testify, and that was an improper comment and that therefore it was reversible error. In Walls, by contrast, the prosecutor made an inadvertent one-time statement about the defendant testifying, and that did not necessitate a mistrial. So um, the opened door doctrine, this you see come up um, usually in closing, but based on what the defense attorney might have said in opening statement. <coughs> so no, under no circumstance can a prosecutor make a comment, like we just said, on a defendant who failed to testify during a trial. We all know that that's off limits. However, if the defense attorney made a comment in opening about assertions of facts that would be proven, and then the defense attorney didn't follow up on that, a prosecutor in closing under the under open door doctrine may call attention to what the 
defense attorney failed to present. Now this particularly comes into play when a defense attorney has actually put on a defense case. So even if the defendant has testified, if the defense attorney has called witnesses, that may open the door to allow a prosecutor to comment on what the defense attorney said that they were gonna show in their case and did not. So there, in the handout, um, there are a ton of cases that address improper remarks, and usually we see this in closing, you know, when everyone is really ramped up. The Hill case is a great one. Um, I think this also might have been out of Prince George's County about cleaning up the streets. In no way can you make comments in closing argument, especially if you're the prosecutor, about how the jury needs to consider the impact that this type of offense has on your community or society. You know, um, you as the jury need to do something about this. That's completely improper, and if objected to by defense counsel, the objection should be sustained. If there's more than one um, comment, a judge really should consider granting a mistrial because otherwise it will be considered reversible error. Likewise, the golden rule, you know, good in life, but not in um, trial, right? Don't do to others um, unless you want it done to yourself, but you can never say in a trial, jury, I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of this victim or this witness, because the moment that you do that, it's gonna be objectionable, it should be sustained. If it's not, it may be reversible error because it asks the jury to focus on sympathy and prejudice and to abandon the neutral fact-finding role. If you notice that you slip up, if you're the attorney in closing argument that where this comment comes out of your mouth, you, if you wanna protect your record, if you wanna make sure that this gets to the jury or doesn't get reversed on appeal, you should ask to approach the bench, indicate that you didn't mean for that comment to come out and ask the judge to um, sustain this in front of the jury and ask the judge to disregard it. All right, there are a number of cases in Maryland where um, usually prosecutors um, have appealed to the jury's fears and prejudices. Lawson is what I consider one of the seminal cases on this. It, it also mentions a case called Spain. Those are opinions that I would urge all of you to read. In Lawson, this was a sex offender case and the prosecutor, among other improper things, asked what does a monster look like, what does a sexual molester look like, um, and then compared it to just normal people that you know in your life. Likewise, we've had other cases where a defendant has been referred to as an animal, <coughs> a pervert, drug dealers, even Nazi Germany. So clearly, you know, I don't think the prosecutor intended for those comments to come out, but in the heat of passion, they did. Likewise, we all know you cannot comment on facts that are not in evidence, and what we sometimes see is a prosecutor might say, if a police officer has testified, well, you know, why would this police officer be lying about the incident? What does he have to gain? You know, he's not getting paid more for a conviction, or he would be reprimanded if he were to be lying on the stand. You cannot say those things. They're facts outside of evidence, um, and they're improper. Likewise, as a prosecutor, you cannot shift the burden of proof. Um, the defense does not have to prove that the victim was lying, so do not say that the defense has to prove that the victim was lying. Don't ask the jury to take mercy into account, um, and don't mention about any consequences of the conviction, such as the sentence, parole, probation, those types of, those types of things. Improper vouching for a witness. What that means is where a prosecutor or a defense attorney says, I believe that that witness was telling the truth, or I believe that the victim was telling the truth. You would think that people would know not to say those things, but surprisingly, they do come up. We have examples from these two cases where the prosecutor said the police officer doesn't have a motive to lie because then he'd risk everything he worked for, or they wouldn't lie because they would lose their jobs. You really cannot get close to that line. Again, we talked about opening the door. All right, before I get into the standards of proof, one last thing I just wanna say on closing arguments. So what the case law has told us is that when, when there is an objection, an objectionable comment, 
you as either the state or the defense attorney really do need to be vigilant about um, making that objection. Now, you'll, you'll hear different schools of thought. Some lawyers don't like to draw attention to that improper comment because then the jury is just going to focus on it. So it is a judgment call that you have to make. My suggestion, though, is if there's been more than one improper comment, it really is your duty, at least as a defense attorney, to make the objection and approach the bench. And the reason is, I have um, I just had a case where I was representing someone who was bringing a post-conviction against his lawyer for a number of um, improper comments made during closing argument that were not objected to. So I did a ton of research on what cases have been reversed and which have not. And what I saw in my research is that where the defense attorney made uh, a prompt objection, requested that a curative instruction be given to disregard it or ask for a mistrial and that was denied, those are the cases where then on appeal, where on appeal had been reversed. Conversely, in the cases that eventually get to post-conviction because the objections were never preserved on the record, a court is much less, the Court of Special Appeals, well, first of all, the trial court, and then if they make it to the Court of Special Appeals, they're much less likely to, to reverse a conviction where the defense attorney didn't do anything to try to cure the record at the time. So I, I think that the case law will be on your side if you make an objection after more than one improper comment by the other side. All right, describing the standards of proof. For those of you who know Andy Jezik, that's him in this picture. He's an attorney that is out of Montgomery County, but he practices all over the state. And <coughs> he had this little uh, stunt, not stunt, but it, you know, it worked. But he used to go into trials, into closing arguments, and he had this board. And the board would list all of the standards of proof and basically how each one was not guilty until you got to proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So he would say, you know, look, if, if self-defense is just highly likely, not guilty. And he would say, if it's just suspected self-defense, not guilty, and so on and so forth. Well, eventually, the prosecutors in Montgomery County got keen to the fact that Mr. Jezik was going to do this, and so they made an objection. In this case, Ingram versus State was Mr. Jezik's case. It made it up to the Court of Appeals. And what the Court of, so because in Ingram at the trial level, what the trial judge did was the trial judge um, precluded Mr. Jezik from some of these extraneous standards like suspicion, reasonable suspicion, probable cause, a tie, said that the jury can't consider those things. However, the trial court did allow defense counsel to explain the difference between preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing, and then proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So, it's it, this case was decided on an abuse of discretion standard, so what that means is the Court of Appeals said that it was not an abuse of discretion where the trial court excluded it. As a practicing defense attorney, if you want to be able to get into these standards, you should argue that Ingram will at least allow you to argue the differences among preponderance, clear and convincing, and beyond a reasonable doubt, so that the jury knows it's not, you know, 50% or 51%, it's not 75%, it's somewhere in the 90s that the state has to overcome. The slide I think should have been removed. All right, impeachment and rehabilitation. There are so many rules that cover this topic, and this really is gonna be, um, if you're a defense attorney, the way that you try to win your case. And prosecutors, you should be aware of these rules as well because it's not as often that you cross-examine witnesses. <coughs> defense attorneys don't always put cases on, um, which is why it's even more important to review the rules and be familiar. So there is in the handout um, in one of the articles a table um, that will list what I'm about to talk about and that is something that I recommend you take with you to trial because it's a quick cheat sheet on what needs, um, on what qualifies as a prior conviction for impeachment. This is Rule 5609, and first of all, as we all know, the conviction has to be an infamous crime or crime relevant to credibility. The conviction must be less than 15 years old, and there's gonna be this balancing of the probative value versus unfair prejudice. So this is in your 
hands out and more specifically, so these are the crimes that are considered infamous crimes or ones relevant to credibility. And in your handout, I have every single case that supports each of these crimes. So when you go to use it in trial, you'll be able to tell the judge, yes, you know, arson falls into this or for forgery or mayhem. Most recently, there was just a 2019 uh, opinion where this is a federal offense, violent crimes in aid of racketeering activity. The witness in that case had a conviction for that offense. The defense attorney was precluded from um, asking the witness about that conviction because at the time it wasn't on this list of infamous crimes. The Court of Appeals said that that was error that, and they went through this whole discussion of what made that a infamous crime. Ultimately though, it was harmless error because there was so much other damning information that came out about the witness that, it, that this additional conviction wouldn't have made a difference. These are the crimes though that do not count. So you know, sometimes you're looking up a witness's or a defendant's prior history and they have a ton of criminal history for these types of offenses, but you're not gonna be able to impeach that person based on these convictions. So what is a conviction? A conviction has to be final, it can't be pending. Um, a plea of nolo contendere followed by a sentence does count as a conviction. Now, the only exception that there is for pending charges that are not final is if a witness who's testifying for the state in a criminal case is expecting to get some benefit from the prosecution, meaning maybe their pending drug possession case is gonna get dismissed if they flip on this defendant and provide information about the drug distribution. That answer may be admissible, that line of questioning and answering. But a conviction does not include something that's pending in appeal. So if there was a conviction and then 25 days later is the trial, that's not technically a final conviction because appeals have to be noted within 30 days. So that's not gonna fall into um, a final conviction. Likewise, if the conviction was reversed on appeal, if it's been pardoned, or if a probation before judgment has been entered, um, it's not gonna be considered a conviction for impeachment purposes. Remember that the jury may only learn about the name of the crime, time and place of conviction, the sentence received, that's it. The jury may not be told the underlying details of the prior conviction, and I'm not sure that every practicing lawyer remembers that because sometimes um, on cross-examination, lawyers try to bring out more details but the rule really only requires those three things coming in. And then there are a list of five factors for the court to consider in, in the balancing, which is the third prong of 5609, and I won't read through them, but they're in the handout that we gave you. Um, all right, so this specifically deals with a defendant's election to testify or remain silent based on a prior conviction. This was a recent case in 2018, Burnside versus State, where the defendant potentially had an impeachable offense in his background. The, de the defendant was contemplating whether or not to testify in his own defense, and so what the defense attorney did was he said, Judge, before my client decides whether to testify or remain silent, I want you, Judge, to do a balancing act here and decide if that conviction is gonna be admissible because if it's going to be admissible, my client's not going to testify. The court refused to do that three-part inquiry um, prior to the defendant's election not to testify and on appeal, the Court of Appeals said that that was error, the trial court abused its discretion. So what the, as the law now stands, if you're a defense attorney and you're trying to make that judgment call with your client, you should request the trial court to rule on whether or not a prior conviction will be admissible for impeachment before your defendant, before your client makes a final decision. And then this is just a jury instruction on impeachment by prior conviction, 322. Okay, and then we also know there's 5608, which you don't have to have a prior conviction. You can still <coughs> offer up facts that go towards one's character for being untruthful. The same crimes though, are going to apply, and we'll get to that slide in a minute. But the difference here is that the conduct may not be proved by extrinsic evidence. So you're stuck with the witness's yes or no answer. So if you say,
to a witness on the stand, isn't it true that in 2015, you robbed someone at gunpoint or you stole $10,000 from this bank? If the witness says no, now they weren't convicted, right? Because there was some glitch. If they were convicted, you would be introducing that. You know they weren't convicted. You went on the Maryland case search. You saw that they were charged. They went through a motions hearing. The case was thrown out because of some technicality, but you still have a good faith basis to be asking these questions. But if they say no, they didn't commit it, you're stuck with that answer. Again, if you go on to case search, and this is what I routinely do, see if there's any prior offense where the witness has been charged with one of these crimes. And if so, what I do, if it didn't result in a conviction, is I go to the jurisdiction where the person was charged and I get a copy of the statement of charges if the case hasn't been expunged so that I have the facts, so that I can walk through the scenario asking that witness those impeachable questions. I also need that because I have to prove to the court that I have a good faith basis for asking these questions. So if I can get a statement of charges, I can just say to the court, see, this is my good faith basis for asking these questions. So again, police reports have this information, statements of probable cause. Sometimes there's prior written statements you can get your hands on, but this is great. Text messages, <coughs> voicemail, Facebook. Some people are very proud of the fact that they've been charged um, and they publicize that, especially if the case is thrown out, they might wanna talk about the police. And so you can find information um, that will be relevant for your inquiry about their character for untruthfulness. But you do have to be careful who you call. So this now goes into character witnesses, which is also under Rule 5608. And um, character witnesses can be used by the state or the defense. They can be used to impeach a witness. They can be used to rehabilitate a witness. But they themselves can be impeached as well. So there's two types of character testimony. One is opinion testimony, and one is reputation testimony. <laughs> What that means, with, let me start with opinion testimony, and I know you all know this, but it's a good refresher. So I might be called as a witness to testify about Bob's character for truthfulness. So what is that means what is my personal opinion about Bob? So the way that I, that would be established, and I think I have um, some questions coming up, but the way that would be established is I would testify how long I've known Bob, in what circumstances, has it only been professional, has it been personal as well? Have we had occasion to talk about sensitive information? Have I told him things that I know he has you know, kept his mouth shut on? That, that's what you wanna do when you're establishing the background necessary. And then once you get through all of those questions, the final couple of questions will be, do you, you know, Ms. Coleman, do you have an opinion as to Mr. Bonsick's character for being truthful? Yes, what is that opinion? I believe that Mr. Bonsick is a truthful person. Now, if you wanna take it one step further, you can get to reputation um, opinion and reputation testimony. What you have to do, you first have to establish the personal opinion, okay? You have to be somebody who knows Bob, but then you also have to establish how you know their reputation in the community. Ms. Coleman, in addition to the personal opinion that you have for Mr. Bonsip, do you have an opinion as to Mr. Bonsip's reputation in the community? Yes. Before I ask you what that, what that opinion is, please tell this jury, how is it that you know Mr. Bonsip's reputation in the community? Well, what community are we talking about? Are we talking about in my law firm? Are we talking about among the defense bar? Are we talking about among all lawyers in the state of Maryland? Well, I can testify to that which I know. I've worked with Mr. Bonsip at our firm for 11 years. I know how people in our law firm consider Mr. Bonsip. I've been to different bar association meetings and presentations with Mr. Bonsip. I know how he's regarded there. Likewise, I've met his friends and family outside of work. Ms. Coleman, based on all of that testimony, do you have um, do you know what Mr. Bonsip's opinion, or excuse me, what Mr. Bonsip's reputation in the community is? Yes, he is regarded as a truthful person. So um, those are the ways that you, those are the distinctions and the ways that you establish both. And these are you know, the types of questions that I just went over with you. But remember, a character witness can be impeached. 
So the state might come up to me and say, well, Ms. Coleman, you've only known Mr. Bonson since 2007, correct? Correct. Did you know that back in his rugby days, you know, when he was 30, that he was doing A, B, and C? Well, no, I, I didn't know that. I, I wasn't even alive back in his 30s. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Ms. Coleman, would your opinion, would your personal opinion as to Mr. Bonson's character for truthfulness, you know, change if I were to tell you that he had, you know, robbed all these banks and, you know, done this, that, and the other? You know, well, maybe it, it would. And, you know, Ms. Coleman, the Mr. Bonson you know never told you that he, that he did those things. Well, no, he didn't. So he kept it a secret from you. So the image that he was portraying to you was what he selected to share with you and not what others knew of him. So, you know, there's ways then, if you're the prosecutor, um, that you can try to impeach. You're not necessarily impeaching the character witness per se, but you're impeaching Mr. Bonson through that very same character witness. But likewise, you can impeach the character witness, right? What if I have some skeletons in my closet? Well, Ms. Coleman, you appear, you know, genuine, you're a good child, you must be a good person, but, you know, and then they bring up things from like Facebook or something. Luckily, I'm not on social media, but certainly there's ways to try to impeach the character witness himself. Um, and these were just some of the examples that I was, that I was giving you about. And you know, we actually see this more often than not about misrepresentations of tax returns. Sometimes you see it in federal court more than state court where the feds just obtain any information about a defendant. And a lot of times people just are not truthful on their tax returns. And so we see those be introduced to try to impeach defendants or witnesses. All right, now, no matter what, a character witness, expert witness, any other witness in a trial cannot testify about whether another witness or a defendant testified truthfully in the action. So if Bob took the stand to testify in his defense, I could give my opinion about his truthfulness generally, but I cannot say, and I don't think he would look live here today, I cannot comment at all on his testimony in the action, and nobody can. And there are these cases that you can refer to, one more recent from 2018, one that has some age on it, but an expert forensic examiner um, invaded the province of the jury by testifying that a minor who was um, a victim showed no signs of fabrication. And likewise, this was another, you know, we see this with sex assault nurses and experts. Those types of witnesses, police officers, cannot give opinion about whether or not they believe um, that the witness or victim is lying or telling the truth. That will be reversible error. And these are just the jury instructions that correspond. So other ways to impeach witnesses, victims, defendants is using their prior statements. Now 5613 is the actual impeachment rule. This is not used for substantive evidence. And in this rule, if a witness has made a prior statement, and you want to try to impeach them, you just ask them questions. Well, didn't you on a prior occasion tell somebody, you know, that you just wanted to get back at your husband, um, that he didn't really do this? No, I never said that. I never, I never wrote that. Are you sure about that? And what this rule says is you don't have to disclose it at the time that you are asking the question, but if you're gonna to try to impeach them, you do have to then bring it up at some point to give them an opportunity to explain or deny it. So you want to kind of lock them into what their answer is, and if they're denying it, well then you can, you know, get a statement, mark it for identification only, because this rule doesn't usually allow extrinsic evidence to be admitted, but now maybe you have a text message between the wife and her best friend where she's saying, this SOB, you know, I'm going to get him, I'm going to show him, you know, I'm going to lie, and you can, you can introduce it to her to review and then give her the opportunity to explain or deny it. Oops, I don't know what I'm doing. <coughs> nope. And the screen is saying the PowerPoint is having a problem.
So Bob said, you know, you have to have backups, right, when things like this occur. So I do have my printed version that I can refer to. And this does happen to us a lot where, you know, things just don't work. I used to freak out about it all the time in the beginning, and now I just kind of expect it as part of the job. So <laughs> I'll just keep going so that we're not holding everyone up. But that was Rule 613, which was about impeachment. A great rule to rehabilitate is Rule 5616. And the reason that that's a great rule, in my opinion, is because there's a committee note at the end of the rule that says, this rule is intended to illustrate the most frequently used methods of impeachment and rehabilitation, but it is not intended to be exhaustive or to foreclose other legitimate methods. So when you look at 5616, you're gonna see a section A, B, C, it has all these ways that you can impeach and rehabilitate, but if you can think of some other way, I would argue to the court, and I have argued to the court, look at this committee note. Just because it's not listed here doesn't mean this isn't a proper way. And so um, it talks about you know impeachment and rehabilitation, and you'll see that in the rule. Another great rule, and this falls under 5806, which is actually a hearsay rule, but this is a rule not used that often, but I was actually in a case with Bob when he did use this rule. This is a rule that says that you may attack the credibility or rehabilitate the credibility of a non-testifying witness. And so, when would that circumstance happen? Maybe a 911 call. A lot of times when you see domestic violence cases between husbands and wives, the wife may assert her spousal privilege so that she doesn't have to testify against the husband. However, when the assault occurred, the wife made a 911 call, which is gonna be admitted, even if the wife doesn't testify, the state can introduce it as an excited utterance because the case law says that'll come in that way. So we had a case um, where Bob was representing a woman, a female who was a victim, now, they weren't married, but she just went on the run and decided not to show up for trial. But the prosecutor still went forward because it was a first-degree assault case. They introduced her 911 call. We tried to impeach her, the, the, the girlfriend, because her statement now came in. We tried to impeach her under this rule, 5806, which says when a hearsay statement has been admitted, such as a 911 call, the credibility of the declarant, the person who made the call, may be attacked by any evidence which would be admissible had the declarant testified as a witness. So we tried to impeach her through opinion and reputation, testimony by character witnesses, I think we had other prior statements, and we were prohibited from doing that because there really wasn't <coughs> case law on the books yet. So when you look at the case Taylor versus State, which is a Court of Appeals 2009 case, the Court of Appeals said it was error to restrict the defendant's impeachment of the non-testifying hearsay declarant's version of the alleged sexual assault. So remember, just because Cindy Joffrey in, in the Prince George's County School Board case, just because she didn't testify or just because that 911 caller doesn't testify, you can still try to impeach them. All right. So now we're, and, that, and this is the rule. The rule of completeness. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but there has been recent case law on this rule. What we see is that prosecutors sometimes choose to play bits and pieces of recorded interviews that defendants give to police officers. Obviously, it's in the prosecutor's interest to just play the, the incriminating portions, but to leave out some of the exculpatory portions. This rule may allow you as a defense attorney to complete that recorded or written statement with the remainder of it, as long as it's relevant, okay? So we actually lost this issue in the recent case that we had where we were trying to introduce other portions of a recording that our um, client made, but they were not necessarily relevant or within the scope of the portion that the state introduced. So, I mean, the record is preserved, we made the objection, but it, it has to be relevant to the portion that the state introduced. So if, if in one part the defendant is talking about how he committed the crime, but then in another part he's talking about how he was on the honor roll and he you know, was a fireman and he's this, that, and the other, that's probably
probably not going to be relevant to the crime, and a defense attorney is not going to be able to get that part in. Um, and this was the case um, in 2018 that really went into detail about it, and I believe that should be in our handout as well. All oh, right, um, and it is almost 11:30. I was told that food might be a while. It's not. Food is usually 11:30, 11:45. Okay, so I can keep talking Absolutely. for a few more minutes, and then I know Jennifer also has an announcement she wants to make. So let me just talk for a few more. Um, minute here. So Bob made this slide, so I'm going to try to interpret what was in his mind when he put this together. <laughs> what did you say? Go to the next one? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. This gets back to some of my stuff. So this now kind of shifts into the rules on authentication. And the reason that this rule is really pertinent in these times is because now there is just so much uh, information that's available outside of your traditional police investigative work. We, Like I said, social media, I keep mentioning it, but that comes up so often in cases. So here we go, use of evidence in the era of technology. Um, Rule 509 only requires uh, you know, some evidence or relevancy as a condition precedent to admissibility. It's really a low threshold to be able to get things introduced. So just put up a witness who has some knowledge of what they're being shown. Um, you can have non-expert opinion on handwriting. We all know, you know what our parents' handwriting looks like or what our spouse's handwriting looks like. You don't need an expert. Um, circumstantial evidence, voice identification, we're gonna see this in some of the cases that we look at, but there are easy ways, and this is all listed in the rule, to try to get evidence introduced. The burden is slight. I was just, in the, I'm sorry I keep referring to this recent trial, but it had like so many different issues, and I was cross-examining the father of the victim in this case, and the client really wanted us to try to introduce cell phone records of the victim, and the victim was still on his father's cell phone plan at the time, so the father was the one receiving the monthly statements and paying the bill. So we had not, we didn't anticipate using these records, so we did not um, properly have them authenticated by a certification ahead of time. So in the middle of cross-examining this witness, with my client's urging, I'm trying to introduce these cell phone records. The state objects, the court sustains it. I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do? I, you know. So what I did was I established with the father, I said, sir, um, do you recognize these bills? And I marked him for identification first, and he flipped through, yes, what are they? These are cell phone bills. How long have you been a customer of Verizon? For two and a half years. Whose numbers do you recognize on this account? My, my wife, my sons. Um, do you routinely receive these and you know pay them and, and check you know to make sure that the, that the accuracy of the bills? Yes, that was enough for me to be able to introduce the cell phone records. I don't know how I did that, but I did. So <laughs> the point is the burden is slight. Any witness with knowledge can authenticate what you're trying to introduce. It does not have to be a certified business record. With respect to phones and voice identification, I mean, this is really easy. In this um, first case, Donati, a detective was able to identify at trial a defendant's voice on a recording because that detective had previously interviewed the defendant and was able to make the voice comparison. Likewise, um, where co-defendants listened to somebody's voice on the telephone, on the jail call, they were able, um, let's see here, I'm sorry, a witness who was familiar with the co-defendant's voices on the jail call were able to authenticate the call, and the call was therefore introduced against the co-defendants. Same with um, this case, Darling, there was a cell phone receipt, I believe, found in a car, and it was matched up to a cell phone receipt that was obtained from the phone company, and there were sufficient you know, details that matched to support the authentication of the receipt found in the car. And likewise, information on cell phones, sometimes if you can you know, have a witness testify about the phone numbers that they recognize, um, the time of day the calls were made, you might be able to establish enough to get information from the cell phone introduced without the business record. Video surveillance footage, there's these two distinct um, 
opinions, Washington versus State, which came first in 2008, is kind of a seminal case. In that case, the state tried to introduce random video surveillance that was just merged together on a disk of like eight different shots. The state never introduced who made that disk, um, what the conditions were that, under which it was recording, was that the full video or were things cut and pasted. So that, it was reversible for um, that tape to come in. But in Jackson versus State, there was footage from Bank of America from the ATM machine and there was testimony that the footage was just copied and sent directly to the investigator. It was not cut, it was not paste, it was not modified. So even though there was a minor discrepancy in the timestamp, which you do often see, at least <coughs> some banks use UTC versus Eastern Daylight Time, that, it, it's okay, that was still authenticated and that was properly admitted. Social media, all right, this has come up for me um, in different cases. Now, just because somebody has a Facebook page and you see their profile and you see content on it, you're not automatically gonna be able to get that introduced. Say you're cross-examining either the victim or a witness for a defendant and you have what you believe is their Facebook page, you're, you're not gonna just be able to introduce it against them. You're gonna have to try to authenticate it in one of these ways. Now you could ask, I could say, hey victim, um, isn't this your Facebook page and your profile? And if she says no, that's it for me, unless I tell one of these other two things. So it's not gonna come in. Now sometimes in, in larger cases we receive computer forensic reports from people's cell phones and computers, and it will show you the date and time that it was that it was uh, posted. It will also link the computer with their email address. So there is circumstantial evidence that will help you authenticate it. The last thing you could do is you could always try to subpoena the social networking website to see if you can try to link up that the person's page is does actually belong to that person. But otherwise, if you just think you're gonna ask the person, um, if they mated it, if that witness has been well prepped, they're going to say no. They're going to say no, I don't recognize this. And um, sublet was a case that, that discussed this. So you can go to that case. And um, yeah, these cases likewise all discuss social media and whether circumstantial evidence mm -hmm. is enough or not to get the evidence off that. And these are all, yeah, sorry. The reason I'm going through these is because these will be in the bar article handouts that you receive. There's an article, I think, that was called Social Media or something, and that's where all these cases are from. This is the self-authentication rule that I was talking about if you actually get it certified from the business. But we've been jammed up before, right? Because, you know, sometimes we're busy. You do need to provide notice to the other side at least 10 days in advance that you're gonna use a certified record or else you can't expect to just introduce a certified record at trial. A lot of times, I don't know how it is exactly in St. Mary's County, but in other counties I can tell you, we'll get notice that the state's gonna introduce a certified record, but that's all it is, is a notice. They don't actually provide us with the record or with the certification. So I always then file um, within five days after receiving notice of that, um, that they're gonna use authenticated records, I always file within five days an objection. <coughs> and I state, you know, all they said was that they're going to introduce records, they have to provide me with the records or an opportunity to inspect the records, and they have to provide me with the certification. And that is all listed in the rule. And this, I believe the rule actually has accepted cert this accepted certification. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just send this out if you're requesting records. All right, so we talked about uh, ways to impeach witnesses with prior statements. Well, this rule talks about ways to use this prior statement substantively. So what's the difference? Sometimes when you're impeaching, you just wanna make the witness look like a liar. You don't really have any other point in examining them except to make them look like a liar. But sometimes you're really happy with what they said initially and you, you're mad that when they come to trial, they've now changed their story, they've been spooked or whatever. So you want to use that prior statement substantively so that you can argue it in your case. Um, and so these are 
this rule, though, only applies to a witness who testifies at trial. So um, the witness has to take the stand, and they have to be subject to cross-examination. And the areas are, you know, is this a prior inconsistent statement? Um, if so, and you want to introduce it as substance, it has to have been given under oath, subject to the penalties of perjury, at a hearing, at a trial, or another proceeding, or it has to be reduced to writing, or it could be video recorded. Yeah, here we go, or video recorded, or a stenographer taking notes. And so what, what are examples of those? Well, uh, certainly grand jury testimony would be an example of a prior statement that's given under oath. Also, it's obtained um, by a stenographer. Likewise, reports in police statements may <coughs> fall under this rule. Sometimes you receive audio recordings by the police, and that likewise would could be used as a prior inconsistent statement substantively under this rule. Can you go back to that slide just for yep. a second? One of the things that I think this is my second time, I'm not sure which one it is, but what they do is these domestic violence cases, I'm not sure if it's on this one or not, maybe not on this one, but they'll have a, a narrative within the police report that, a, that says what the complainant says, and then they'll have them sign a block at the bottom, and that specifically then allows them to use this rule that the complainant backs out at trial and wants to say something. So they now have a substantive statement that, yeah, he smacked me in the face. Even though it's very, you know, very limited, it's signed by the declarant, signed by the victim, and, and this rule allows them a lot of times to go forward in some of those cases. So there's so inconsistent statements, consistent statements, statements of identification, prompt complaint of a sex assault, and past recollection recorded. Um, again, I told you that for this <coughs> rule, the declarant has to testify and has to be subject to cross-examination. Um, but the rule does not preclude extrinsic evidence. So what I mean by that is if the victim testifies, gives a statement, um, you want to use their prior statement, you don't have to use it while that um, victim is on the stand. You don't have to use it on cross-examination with that victim. You can then call the detective who took the statement from the victim and introduce that prior statement through the detective. So that is a distinguishing feature with this rule versus some of the impeachment rule where you have to actually confront the uh, declarant. You don't have to do that in this rule. You can use another witness. We just talked about prior inconsistent statements and some of the places where you can find those statements. Prior consistent statements, this one is a little bit different if you all remember from law school. A prior consistent statement can only be used substantively if you can prove that it's rebutting an express or implied charge against recent fabrication or improper influence or motive. Um, it's, it's admissible only if it was made before the source of bias, interest, influence, or incapacity originated. These are examples, but I'm gonna kind of skip through these. Prior identification, this is a statement that's probably given to a police officer after a witness observed the bank robber, robber or the person who assaulted them. It's just, or it's used during a photo spread or a lineup, so it's technically hearsay, but it's gonna be admitted. A detective can testify to it because it was one made for purposes of identification. Now, this one prompts complaints against uh, of sexual assault. This should be studied more by each of you because there are limitations, but there's also um, expansions as well. So, what are the limitations? So, we know that when there's a victim of sexual assault, they might make, um, a 911 call, they might make a statement to the police officer, they might make a statement in the hospital, they might, if it's a child, they might make a statement to a parent, they might make a statement to all of those people. The only, the limitations are these, that the victim must actually testify. So the state can't introduce the victim's statement about the, the assault unless the victim testifies. The complaint must be timely and it's restricted just to the identification of the culprit and the time, date, and crime um, that in which it occurred. The recounting of the circumstance in full detail is not permitted. So all the state can introduce
abuse is that the defendant uh, molested me on January 1st at 5 p.m. and the defendant is John Doe. That's it. It cannot go into well, what was the um, actual sex assault that occurred. What does timely mean? The courts have basically construed this very liberally. It means a complaint made without a delay that's unexplained. However, so it could mean a complaint made within minutes of the offense, but the courts have also said it could be a complaint made within days, months, or even years if there's a reasonable explanation as to the delay. And the way that you measure the delay is look at the person's age, right? A child is gonna be given more leeway than an adult. So if the child waits years to bring this complaint, maybe they waited years because they had to get out of the house of the abuser. Maybe the abuser was a family member. So it makes sense that they would wait until they were 18.